Good morning, friends. It is my privilege to introduce our speaker today. Dr. Daryl Bach serves as Senior Research Professor of New Testament Studies at Dallas Seminary, as well as the Executive Director of Cultural Engagement in the Hendricks Center. Dr. Bach has earned recognition as a Humboldt Scholar, Tübingen University in Germany. He's the author of over 40 books, including well-regarded commentaries on Luke and Acts and studies of the historical Jesus and work in cultural engagement as host of the Seminary's Table podcast. He served as president of the Evangelical Theological Society, ETS, from 2000 to 2001, has served as a consulting editor for Christianity Today, serves on the boards of Wheaton College, Institute for Global Engagement, the Hope Center, Christians in Public Service, and Chosen People's Ministries. His articles appear in leading publications. He is often an expert that is sought after uh, on media inquiries in New Testament issues. Dr. Bach has also been a New York Times best-selling author in nonfiction, serves as a staff consultant for Bent Tree Fellowship Church in Carrollton, Texas, and is Elder Emeritus at Trinity Fellowship Church in Dallas. When traveling overseas, he will tune in frequently into the current game involving his favorite teams from Houston, Texas. Dr. Bach, all we can all do is say we're awfully sorry for what is going on. He is married to Sally for over 40 years. He's the proud father of two daughters and a son and is also a grandfather. It is a privilege to do life and ministry with you, Daryl Bach. And so would you please join me in welcoming him today? I know. I understand. How do y'all? Um, it's okay to be an Astros fan, and just remember, it ain't over till it's over. So, uh, uh, but we'll talk about that another time. This is about reconciliation today, so uh, it's a good starting point to talk about <laughs> Rangers and Astros. Uh, I have a I have a little grab bag here that I've brought with me. So let me uh, just see what's going on here. Um, let's see here. We've got um, who knows what this is. That's a systematic theology by Lewis Sperry Chafer himself. That's number one. Let's see what else we've got in here. Let's see. Um, oh, yeah. This is a genuine Hebrew Bible. That's the Old Testament sitting right there in front of you. Uh, let's see what else I've got in here. Um, this is uh, my Greek Testament, which is seen better days. <laughs> uh, this is um, the whole Bible put together. <laughs> and then this is a book on practical and biblical approaches to spiritual formation called Conform to His Image, and it's talking about the practical aspects of our life. You come to Dallas Seminary, and you come to put this kind of stuff in this kind of space, okay? <laughs> And I don't know about you, but when I think about that and conceptualize it, okay, I go, oh man, that's going to be a squeeze. <laughs> so um, that's knowledge. That's wisdom. I want to put that wisdom in context. I want to talk about one of the most famous passages in all of theater history from William Shakespeare. Uh, it's in a play called As You Like It. And the scene is called The Seven Stages of Life. You'll recognize it as soon as I put it up on the screen. This is how it begins. All the world is a stage, and all the men and women merely players. They have their exits, and they have their entrances. Seven stages of life, according to William Shakespeare. Infant, school life, lover, soldier, justice and judge, pantaloon, it's been a long time since I used that word, and oblivion, the end. That segment of discourse ends with these set of sentences. Last of all, talking about number seven, oblivion, 
That ends this strange, eventful history. It's, it's childlessness, mere oblivion, sans teeth, sans eyes, sans taste, sans everything. It is into this abyss that unconventional wisdom enters and forms a counterstage to life as most see it. So I want to talk to you today about a passage in the book of Ephesians. No surprise. All right? In the book of Ephesians. Now, you thought it was going to be Luke Acts. Okay? Uh, in Ephesians. I've taught this book for many years, and I'm going to one of the passages that took me the longest to kind of sort out what exactly was going on. And so I want to tell you what was going on with that text. So turn if you have a Bible or if you have a device to which you, you know, just swipe and get there or click and go there, however you go there. I tell people that if they have a Bible on their phone, it's not a smartphone, it's a spiritual phone. Anyway, uh, turn, if you will, to Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 7. The verse I'm interested in is verse 10, but I want to put it in context. Paul is speaking about his, miracle, his ministry in a context in which some people say, oh, this is a parenthesis. I'm going to show you it's no parenthesis at all. It's actually at the heart of the letter. And I'm going to argue it's actually at the heart of the New Testament. In fact, I'm going to actually argue that it's at the heart of our calling as men and women of God. I became a servant of this gospel according to the gift of God's grace that was given to me by the exercise of his power. To me... Less than least of all the saints, this grace was given to proclaim to the Gentiles the unfathomable riches of Christ and to enlighten everyone about God's secret plan, the mystery that has been hidden for ages in God who has created all things. The purpose of this enlightenment is that through the church, the multifaceted, and I'm going to add one word, unconventional wisdom of God should now be disclosed to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms. Here is our text. The multifaceted wisdom of God, the unconventional wisdom of God, on display for people not to read about, not to hear about, but to see. You see, this text is set in a background of the first century world. And Paul is talking about the fact that God has asked Jews and Gentiles, who, by the way, did not get along, to come and be part of a new thing that God was doing, what he called the new man in chapter 2. And that new man is that in Christ, God was going to take very disparate people who had no sense that they would be family at all and bring them together and make them part of the family of God. If you know anything about the history of the period leading into the first century, things like the Maccabean War or the Rome, Roman takeover of Israel, then you will know that Jews and Gentiles did not get along. The Maccabean War was an attempt to wipe Judaism off the face of the earth. Sound familiar? And in the midst of that, to bring people together, this call to bring Jew and Gentile together into one body was as radical as anything you could have said at any point of time in the history of mankind. It's unconventional wisdom. It's wisdom unlike the world. In 1 Corinthians 1, we hear that the Jews seek signs and the Greeks seek wisdom. But what we are talking about is not mere knowledge. We're talking about knowledge plus. We're talking about something beyond knowledge. We're talking about not only what you knew, know, but what you see and what you do. And if you work backwards in this book, you will sense that because not only do we have the section at the end of chapter 2, which talks about Jew and Gentiles being put together into one body, that reconciliation, that work. Paul says in 2 Corinthians, we have a ministry of reconciliation. Oh, you see that. But if you work backwards, you go back to Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, what I like to call the Protestant creed. You know it. We're saved by grace through faith, not of works, lest any one 
should boast. And then in 2.10 it says this. Why does he do it? Why does he save us by his grace? Why does he save us by his power? Why did he raise and seated us together in the heavenly places in Christ? 2.10. For we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. And if you ask what is the first good work that God did to show what the purpose of his salvation is and what his mission is in delivering us, at least a part of it. It's 2, 11 to 22. I'm going to bring Jew and Gentile together and I'm going to make them one new man. I'm going to take two groups of people who are terrifically estranged from one another and make them family. And then earlier he prays a prayer. And in that prayer at the end of chapter 1, because this is all linked together, it's all one story that Paul is telling as he lays out. He prays for this. He prays that the Ephesians might understand the wealth of his glorious inheritance in the saints. Before that, what is the hope of his calling? And then he parks here. And what is the incomparable greatness of his power towards us who believe as displayed in the exercise of his immense strength, the same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead and seated him above all rulers and authorities. And he's doing it in his church. We've been given the power to display what it is God is asking of us. And so we come to this unconventional wisdom. We're on this stage in which we are players, but we better know what game we're playing. We better know what the plot is of the story. And the story is to display the goodness and grace of God. Listen to the quote at the end of Shakespeare again. Last of all, that ends this strange eventful history. Childlessness, mere oblivion, sans teeth, sans eyes, sans taste, sans everything. It is into this abyss, this is my commentary on it, it is into this abyss that unconventional wisdom enters and forms a counterstage to life as most see it. We are about the business of showing that God is at work in bringing people together, not just to him, but to one another. That's our calling. And when you think about oblivion, people who are not connected to God That's their future. And when you think about sharing the gospel, that it's the middle of this reconciliation, you have four hurdles to get over as you share. I tell people that when you do evangelism in a modern world in which 30% of the population in the United States is among the nuns, they're not connected to any religion whatsoever. By the way, that's N-O-N-E-S. When you're connected to the nuns, who haven't darkened the door of a church or don't know much about the church, their only understanding of Christianity is what they hear from the Christians that they see and know or what they hear in public space. Who wants their Christianity to find that way? There are four categories that you have to deal with because when you're doing evangelism, you're actually creating categories some people may not even have yet. Here are four of them. Does God exist? Does God even exist? Is he even there? We talk about God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. Is he even there? Does that sentence, the beginning of that sentence, even make sense? Or the second one. Does he speak? The Bible says. Or God says. In that second category, neither of those words may make sense to the person you're talking to. It's a category that may not even exist. Or if it does, it's vague. Or the third one, think about this. Jesus Christ is the answer. The Son of God. Who else, out of all the human beings who have ever walked the earth, says they are the creator God incarnate? It's a big hurdle. Or fourth, 
And also essential is the idea that we are accountable to this God whether we recognize it or not. Those are hurdles that we have as we share, as people are living in an end that Shakespeare says ends in oblivion. And we know it ends differently. Unconventional wisdom going to a different place. And that unconventional wisdom is about far more than what we know. It is about who we are and what we are about. So all the world is a stage, and our lives are called to be a display of this unconventional wisdom of, of not just strengthening the church worldwide, but loving others more than ourselves. It means that what we know means nothing without knowing what that knowledge is for. I like to quote John 3.16 in a short version. You know the verse. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever should believeth in him should not perish but have eternal life. It's the only sentence where I use the word whosoever. I like to shorten it into God so loved the world he gave. That's what we're supposed to show. It's an unconventional wisdom. We display and image God by displaying this unconventional wisdom in the face of a world that may not see it may not even want to see it, but needs it. It's an unconventional meaning. It means working to get to know one another. It means working to get to know people who are different from us. It means that we are our brothers and sisters in Christ, and one person has looked at the church in the way in which we're even fighting with each other these days and says, you know what, God has adopted us, but have we adopted one another? It also means working to get to know those who don't know him yet and have no sense of location in life, the end is oblivion. Listening and hearing the cry to avoid that oblivion and to make sense out of what comes before it and what comes as a result of being headed in that direction. So I want to take you to another era of estrangement. Like the Jew and Gentile period of the first century. And it is... The era of slavery and the separation of blacks and whites. And I want to tell you about a hymn that comes right out of that era. And so our story begins in a place where I was three weeks ago as I was meeting with pastors from around the country to talk about the state of the church in the U.S. And we happen to be in Charleston, South Carolina, and the picture that you see there is at the front entrance to the First Baptist Church of Charleston, South Carolina. This is an old church in American terms. Not that old for Europe, but for the U.S. Here's the plaque. The First Baptist Church, Charleston, South Carolina, founded in 1682. It is the oldest Baptist church in the South. And here is the cornerstone that tells the history of that church. It was established on September 25th, 1682 in Kittery, Maine. I don't even know where that is. It was moved to the site in Charleston in 1699, and the building, and I'm going to be showing you pictures of some of it inside in a minute, was dedicated in January of 1822. And they put a time capsule in it in 1983, and it's supposed to be opened in 2083. I wonder how many of us will be alive when that happens. Interesting place. It, is, it houses what is known as the balcony. See a picture of it there. Here's the story. Here are the stairs that take you to the balcony. It's on the side of the church. It's where slaves went to worship on Sunday. They went up side stairs and stood in the balcony during the service. Here is the plaque that is dedicated to them. It says this, of the thousands of enslaved members of First Baptist Church of Charleston whose names we do not know, but are written in the Lamb's Book of Life, Revelation 7-9. That plaque was put up there just a few years ago to commemorate this space in the church. Why am I telling you this? 
I'm telling you this because I want to tell you the story of a piece of music that you're very familiar with, but you may not know the story behind it. And it involves this man, John Newton. You see his dates, 1725 to 1807. Let me tell you the story of John Newton. And I'll, you should be able to follow this. If you can't, don't worry, I'll fill it in. In the 1740s, John Newton was a slave trader who came to Christ in the middle of the 18th century. How did that happen? He was aboard a ship one night when a violent storm broke out, and moments after he left the deck, the crewman who had taken his place was swept overboard. And although he manned the vessel for the remainder of the tempest, he commented that throughout the tumult, he realized his helplessness and concluded only the grace of God could save him. Prompted by what he had read in Kempis, Newton took the first, albeit small, step towards accepting religion. In the words of his hymn, this incident marked the hour I first believed. Do you know where I'm going? Which hymn? Upon his safe return home in the night, late 1740s, Newton immediately wrote to the Catlett family to plead his case for Mary Cartlett's hand, his wife-to-be. Although he could offer her no financial security. Sound familiar for a minister? <laughs> when Mary herself replied that she would consider his request, he returned to slaving to better his fortunes, this time on a ship full of slaves bound across the Atlantic to Charleston, South Carolina. First Baptist was where he came. And then he moved to Britain in the 1750s. He came to this church... We're on the floor. I didn't mention this when I showed you the picture, so let me go back there. On the floor sat all the slave owners. In the balcony stood all the slaves. Let's pick up our story. Newton wed Mary Cartlett in 1750, a changed man. He accepted the helm of a ship bound for Africa. This time he encouraged the sailors under his charge to prayer rather than to taunt them for their beliefs. He also began to ensure that every member of his crew treated their human cargo with gentleness and concern. However, it would be another 40 years until Newton openly challenged the trafficking of slaves. Some three years after his marriage, Newton suffered a stroke that prevented him from returning to sea. In time, he interpreted this as another step in his spiritual voyage. He assumed a post in the customs office in the port of Liverpool and began to explore Christianity more fully. As Newton attempted to experience all the various expressions of Christianity, it became clear he was being called to the ministry, and he became ordained in June of 1764. In about 1772, he penned Amazing Grace as a story of his entire life under God's grace. Here's the twist in the story, the part you may not know. William Wilberforce, a member of Parliament, was the nephew of one of Newton's London friends. Inspired by the former slave trader and paralleling Newton's own conversion, Wilberforce began to question his role in life. Although Newton, then a lowly only curate, was, con was convinced that Wilberforce was just another wealthy politician, so what else is new? He persuaded him to crusade for change and use his station in life and his powerful friends, including Prime Minister Pitt, to seek reform. He pursued the unconventional wisdom. Now, there's no specific link between Amazing Grace and the abolition of slavery in Britain. Nonetheless, the hymn was written by a man who was moved to speak out against something from which he had once profited. The hymn is the story of a turn that evidenced a changed life. Um, Ephesians 3, verse 10, says this. The purpose of this enlightenment is that through the church, the multifaceted, unconventional wisdom of God should now be disclosed to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. Our call 
is to be an audiovisual of the amazing grace of God. And the audiovisual of the amazing grace of God is seen in the reconciliation of people who would not normally be together. The hymn is a story of a turn, evidence of a changed life. And uh, when Newton said, I hope that it, his salvation story, which is what the hymn is about, his entire life, will always be a subject of humiliating reflection to me. That once, that I was once an active instrument in a business at which my heart now shudders. An unconventional wisdom lands and thinks about and sees how people made in the image of God are being treated. And sharing God's grace leads to people thinking about how God relates to those who he has created. It's an extension of grace faith that grew in understanding as time passed for Newton. Grace faith leads into unconventional wisdom for all to see. It's part of the potential and powerful witness to unconventional wisdom that God calls us to. The care for how God is forming us corporately in a core part of display of the mystery of God and the grace of God. Paul's calling is not his alone. It's ours. We are to own it. We are to contemplate it. We are to display it. This kingdom of many tribes and many nations in reconciliation, I would submit is the core story of the New Testament. If you think about the New Testament from beginning to end, from Matthew to Revelation, what it is talking about is God's restoring the creation. He restores the creation so that men and women made in the image of God who are supposed to steward the creation and steward it well and steward it cooperatively can shed their competition and animus of one another can be family before God. We invite people into that space. We give them that location. We obliterate oblivion. And whether you think about the second half of most of the letters in the New Testament that talk about how Jews and Gentiles are going to get along so they'll be family, or whether you think about the gospel and how Jews and Gentiles are brought together by what it is that Jesus Christ is offering as he dies for all, or if you go back to our passage in Ephesians 3.10 that says, as Paul declares his message in verse 8, to proclaim to Gentiles the unfathomable riches of Christ, a Jewish Messiah is going to save you a Gentile. Or to enlighten everyone about God's secret plan, the mystery that has been hidden in the ages in God who has created all things. The bringing together of people who are estranged, not just to individually connect to God, but to corporately connect to one another so that we can get back to Genesis 1 and the mandate that God gave all of us to be fruitful and multiply and subdue the earth. Only the subduing was designed. That subduing was designed to be a place where creation would hum and function, not be in dysfunction. I tell people we're designed to be hummers. We're supposed to function in such a way that we work together. Even the creation of man and woman was put in that place. The woman was brought alongside the man. Let me replay the story for you. As the creation was happening and God was parading all of his creation in front of Adam, looking for someone who might fit with Adam, and he brought everything in front of him, and Adam went, nope, 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 nope. And then he created Eve. And Adam went, oh, man. And the creation got promoted from good to very good. Why? Because someone next to me, different than me, would help us manage the creation that God gave us and to do it well. He would make, we would make the creation hum. 
That's our calling. It might be the core value of the core values. That through God, he would take people who because of sin are thoroughly estranged from one another and bring them back to himself. And in the worship of that moment, they would not only be brought back to God, they would amazingly be brought back to each other. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see unconventional wisdom. That, ladies and gentlemen, is our calling. And as Nike likes to say, just do it. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for this time to reflect on the message of your word. How you call us to bring people back together as we are reminded that we think about the mission of the church and what goes on even in public space, with people who are made in your image, that we would come to appreciate the fact that you have designed us to reflect who you are. God so loved the world that he gave. May we do the same by the way that we live with those around us. May we care for people whose end is not destined to be oblivion, but whose end is designed to be with you. We ask these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen.